Hey, everybody, and welcome to Talking Hockey Sense. I'm Chris Peters. This is episode 111 of the podcast, and it is conference championship week in college hockey, which makes it one of the most exciting times of the year. A lot of teams are going to figure out whether or not they're going to the NCAA tournament and going to the Frozen Four in St. Paul in early April. But boy, it's been a lot of fun watching the college hockey playoffs and unfold across the conferences. We will break down each of the upcoming finales for each conference, including the CCHA and Atlantic Hockey, both of which you can watch on Flow Hockey later this week. We'll also answer your listener questions, uh, many of which about, about college hockey, about the draft, about so much more in the prospect world. So we'll get into that at the end of the show. And we'll also talk a little bit about some of the different things that we got to see on Flow Hockey in recent weeks. And there's going to be a heck of a lot more to come. So I'm going to take that opportunity to remind you, if you haven't yet, subscribe to Flow Hockey. There's no better time than right now. You can get a lot of great hockey. You get the conference championships for the NCAA conferences that we have. You have the ECHL getting ready for the stretch run of their regular season. Same goes for the USHL and junior leagues across Canada and the United States that we are able to bring to you. We've got the USPHL National Championships coming up this weekend. So there is so much great hockey that you can watch with a subscription. So go to flowhockey.tv and make sure you are signed up. And also check out all of the content we have for you there. There is so much there, including this very podcast. So uh, either download it on your app of choice or make sure to watch us on the Flow Hockey app or the Flow Sports app and also on YouTube as well as on flowhockey.tv. So plenty of ways to interact with this podcast. And also want to remind you, if you haven't yet, leave a kind rating and review. It really does help us get up the charts and allow us to uh, get to more people. And so if you like this podcast and want to see it continue, sign up uh, all your pals and tell them to leave a nice kind review. It will certainly help. So let's get into it today because we've got some conferences that are already done with their semifinals, others that will have their semifinals go this weekend. But we'll start with two that are going to play straight championships this weekend. And it starts on Friday night with the CCHA. That is going to be our number one uh, conference championship game that we have. Uh, they kick off the whole weekend, and it'll be Bemidji State versus Michigan Tech in what should be an incredible one. And it's always weird to see the CCHA final and not see Minnesota State playing in it, but that'll be the case this time around as uh, Bemidji State and both Michigan Tech did their thing to get through. Michigan Tech dispatched Minnesota State in one of the most dramatic finishes of the college hockey season to date, scoring with 9.1 seconds remaining in the game. Absolutely insane finish. Blake Patilla, uh, or Pietela, who has been one of the great goalies in college hockey over the last few years, is heading back to another championship game in his fifth and final year at Michigan Tech. And uh, Logan P Pietela was, the, uh, was a big hero in that game as well, scoring on a penalty shot and then also getting credit, I believe, for that final goal. So uh, just an incredible a game that we have coming up for you on Bemidji, Bemidji State, and you, or with Bemidji State, who won the regular season title. So, talk a little bit more about them. I mean, this is a team that has a lot of depth. They have good, good. They're pretty good top to bottom. You know, the guys that we'll be keeping our eye on, Leighton Road, a guy that is a sophomore. You know, I think he's getting some NHL interest as well. He's a good all-around player, has 30 points in 37 games this year. You know, Matias Scholl has been an outstanding uh, goaltender for them, the junior, with a 909 save percentage. And the important thing about the CCHA and the Mason Cup final that we'll see on Friday night, both of these teams, the only path to the NCAA tournament is winning the CCHA. The CCHA teams, also based on pairwise ranking right now, would more than likely be the 16 seed, so the last seed in that bracket. Now, Boston College and Boston University are essentially locked into number one and two. So either way, you're going to play the toughest matchup in the first round. But getting in is a huge accomplishment in itself. Winning the Mason Cup is a huge accomplishment in itself. And then you give yourself a chance because in a single game elimination, anything can happen. And certainly a team like like Bemidji State, like Michigan Tech, they have enough weapons to threaten the biggest teams. And if they defend well enough against a team that's as skilled as a Boston College or a Boston University, then they are, you know, they, they give themselves a chance if your goalie gets hot at the right time. So either one of those teams can certainly do it. But you have to win on Friday night first. It's going to be a fantastic broadcast on Flow Hockey as well. 
Ben Holden, longtime play-by-play guy in college hockey, actually called CCHA games back in the old CCHA. Um, and then you've got Pat Micheletti, who's a legend of college hockey in Minnesota. Uh, certainly a guy that, that Minnesotans will n- not necessarily need to be reintroduced to, but it'll be great to have those two guys on the call passionate guys and it'll be a neutral broadcast as well which i think is kind of fun um you know we've we've typically had home broadcasters for ccha games this will end up being a neutral broadcast so fans of both bemidji state and michigan tech can enjoy uh you know a down the middle broadcast and and that'll be fun too um it's always great to get the home broadcasters in there but i think you know with benny and 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 uh, pat micheletti doing the the broadcasting it's going to be a, a an event and I, I think that's really cool so really really excited for the ccha mason cup championship game and then on saturday night we'll have the atlantic hockey championship game playing for the jack riley memorial trophy and it'll be rit the regular season champion versus aic very familiar foes two of the top teams in atlantic hockey over the last you know decade essentially um you've had you know aic with multiple uh appearances in the ncaa tournament in recent years rit of course famously once went to a frozen four is a bit of a cinderella story and they have a great advantage in this game in that well actually i think both teams have an advantage in this game with their goaltenders it's going to be a great goaltending matchup between these two teams and it starts with rit's tommy scarfoni was the goalie of the year in atlanta hockey had just a tremendous season a 928 save percentage he was outstanding in the net for uh, rit all season long he's been one of the top goalies in college hockey and he gives them a chance in every single game and rit had some very critical wins earlier this season non-conference which really does allow them you know that they had a chance at one point it seemed to maybe even get in as an at-large a long time ago obviously the way the schedule plays out the math works out the pairwise works out their only way to the ncaa tournament is now to win their conference but just a couple of the key wins that rit had this season that should prepare them for this you know they 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 had a a a win against notre dame this year you know they had a win against new hampshire which was a team that was really on the cusp of doing something special this season uh beat clarkson in a non-conference game as well so they had some key wins outside of atlantic hockey but now they've really been rolling and they they went ahead and swept niagara in the first Uh, in the last round of the, or in the semifinals, and just really outstanding work by them to to get through that. A team that can score a lot. They have Carter Wilkie, who's a guy that that is one of the top players in Atlantic hockey over the last two seasons. And then they've also, you know, gotten some major contributions from Cody Laskowski as well in a breakout season, 40 points to lead the team. Meanwhile, AIC had to get in the hard way. They went three games against Holy Cross in the semifinals. They end up getting in, uh, you know, they, they kind of dominated that last game. And then on top of that, you know, this is a team that has experience. They have a few guys that have been through this process before, guys that have played in the NCAA tournament, that have played in these big games. And when you have that, you really have an opportunity to do something special because experience really does matter here. But really where things are going to get interesting is they're rocking a freshman goalie going into this into this tournament nils wallstrom has been outstanding this year a 921 save percentage and 32 appearances 1911 and two is his record and just really tremendous goaltending from him throughout the tournament as well now holy cross had a lot of offensive firepower but aic was really able to slow them down they've gotten some tremendous contributions from up and down their lineup they're led in scoring by a fifth year player in dustin mans who has 31 points in 38 games and then john lundy a sophomore has 14 goals to lead the team in that category this is a team that's going to get shots they're going to put pressure on scarfoni and it's going to be an absolute war to get out of the eight Atlantic hockey this year. And so the auto bid is on the line. Both of those teams have a chance, uh, depending on how things shake out, could be the 15 seed, uh, whichever one wins, and would more than likely play Boston University in that situation. So uh, very fascinating. And also should note, in the season series in the CCHA, Michigan Tech is 2-1-1 one, and one against Bemidji State. And in the Atlantic hockey series, that one was split only two games between rit and aic this year and each one won so get ready for some outstanding hockey on 
Flow Hockey. We'll have highlights for you. We'll have analysis. We have stories and previews up on flowhockey.tv as this podcast is going out. So make sure that you are prepared for those series because trips to the NCAA tournament are on the line. Moving on. So these are the events that are not on Flow Hockey, but certainly ones worth following. And a lot of eyes are going to be on the Big Ten Championship game. And oh boy, is that going to be a dandy. You've got Michigan versus Michigan State, one of the great rivalries. Michigan State won the season series 3-1. to one. They won the regular season Big Ten Championship. They get a bye, and now they've just been waiting uh, to, to get through. And here they are now getting ready for Michigan. And they will host Michigan at Munn. Uh, it's going to be sold out. It's going to be rocking. It's going to be amazing. I think, you know, the the Big Ten really opened the door for a lot of teams to say, hey, maybe we should do on-site, on-campus championship games and get that atmosphere back. I was at Mariucci a couple times when it was the Big Ten championship and it was Minnesota versus Michigan. This time it'll be Michigan State versus Michigan. I mean, I can only imagine what it's going to be like in Munn uh, for that game and th- that series. But Two good teams. I think that the advantage goes to Michigan State because they have the better goaltending, and that's really been a difference-making thing for them. Trey Augustine, the Detroit Red Wings draft prospect, is an outstanding player and has been really good. He ends up being the uh, the second team All-Big Ten to Wisconsin's Kyle McClellan. But Michigan State, with a real opportunity here to win some hardware, to advance to the uh, – to advance to the the NCAA tournament, they're already in basically as an at large, but to go in with that momentum of winning your conference, winning a couple of series, playing some hard fought games that really allows you to do it. Meanwhile, Michigan is just like, Hey, we've been here before we've done it. They've got experience. Gavin Brindley just named the big 10 player of the year. Columbus blue jackets pick. He's the top scorer in the conference. You look at, Rucker McGrory, you look at Frank Nazar, you look at Seamus Casey, you look at TJ Hughes. There is so much offensive firepower here for Michigan, and they have been a team that really comes alive in these situations, these big game situations, looking more and more like the Wolverines are going to get in regardless of if they win their conference to get into the NCAA tournament. They've had some very important weeks in building their resume to get in and, 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 and improving their math to get in. That's a basically what you have to do. And so Michigan, Michigan State will meet for the Big Ten Championship for the first time, uh, and we cannot wait to see that one. Meanwhile, you're going to go over to Lake Placid, and you're going to see the ECAC, and that is going to be the semifinals and final. On Friday, you'll see Quinnipiac versus St. Lawrence and Cornell versus Dartmouth in an all-Ivy League showdown. Obviously, you know, Quinnipiac, the defending national champion, that is a team that will certainly be watched closely. They fell short of the ECAC championship last year. Certainly something that they want to improve on and make uh, make some waves here. St. Lawrence could give them a little bit of trouble. Cornell and Dartmouth are two real good teams, and I think Cornell in particular, they've got to win. They've got to win to get in. That is the only way. Quinnipiac has the at-large. They're going to be fine. They won't, you know, there's really no way that they're going to miss out in the NCAA tournament, but Cornell has to win to get in and they they've been hovering around it. They're on the bubble right now, but there is really no path forward for them uh, without winning the conference in this setting. And so we'll see if Ian Shane and, and the group there can really ha- hunker down and make something happen, but they're going to have to get through Dartmouth first. We've talked a little bit about Cooper black, their big six foot seven goaltender. That is an NHL prospect. And you got to give a ton of credit to Reed Cashman for the job that he's done at Dartmouth. Very difficult job, uh, but he has managed to, help get the big green back on track. And if they can upset Cornell here, if they can upset Quinnipiac or St. Lawrence or whoever, you know, if they can get in, boy, that'll be, uh, that'll, that'll also knock another team out of the at large situation there. So I think if you are a bubble team, you're certainly rooting for the favorites here. You already know the bottom two spots are going to go to Atlantic hockey and CCHA. And if you're sitting up in that third spot in the pairwise right now, third from bottom, uh, third from 16 and, I guess 14 in in some people's world. (laughs) If you're ranked 14, you really are hoping that favorites win out here in the conference finals. Uh, But yeah, that'll be a great one for the ECAC over in Lake Placid. Then we move down to Boston or move over to Boston rather. And 
you know, I would say this is going to be fa fascinating theater. You got the four best teams in the conference, UMass versus Boston College, Maine versus Boston University. You've got some of the best players in the country here uh, between these two games. You've got, you know, if it's Bradley Nadeau for, for Maine, if it's Ryan Ufko for UMass, if it's, you know, Cutter Gauthier, Will Smith, Gabe Perot, if he's healthy, Ryan Leonard, you know, all these guys that are playing, uh, you know, the star players, Macklin Celebrini, Lane Hudson, you know, the, the, it's just an incredible, incredible cavalcade of stars in this Hockey East final. And, I, you know, I think there's a really good chance that the Hobie Baker is going to come out of the Hockey East. I think it could come down to Cutter Goche and Macklin Celebrini here at the end of the season. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but those two guys are up for player of the year in Hockey East. They're among the finalists. That starts Friday. Those will be semifinals. And then we'll see who advances to the championship game and gets that auto bid. All four of those teams at this point looking pretty good to get in there. UMass is the most at risk of, you know, falling into the bubble category. Uh, they're currently 13th in the pairwise, and they have a, according to College Hockey News' pairwise probability matrix, a 91% chance of getting in to the tournament, an 84% chance at an at-large bid. So that is going to be a very important uh, opportunity for for them to try and, you know, really handle their own fate a little bit and, and control their own destiny by trying to get past a Boston College team that, that has been real formidable, only five losses this season for the Eagles. Then we go out west to St. Paul, and the NCHC will wrap things up for us. And on Friday, it'll be Omaha versus North Dakota. Omaha upsetting Colorado College, putting Colorado College's national tournament hopes on hold. Um, and the celebration is certainly not happening in Colorado Springs yet. And they are going to be watching all of these results with bated breath because they can only get in as an at-large now that they're out of their tournament. So CC is going to be watching all of this very closely. Now, if Omaha gets in, they could further knock out CC. But uh, Nebraska-Omaha getting the big upset there in a three-game series. And then over, we have, we have St. Cloud State versus Denver. St. Cloud State hard-fought series with Western Michigan. They get through, and they will play Denver anybody's tournament here. North Dakota has had a tremendous season. Jackson Blake, a legitimate Hobie Baker candidate. They've gotten really solid goaltending for most of the season. Their defense has held up better than I think anybody expected it to. They've been a little inconsistent, but they're still a team that's a real threat. Denver, same situation. They've had a little bit of inconsistency. They don't defend overly well at all times, not consistently, I should say, but they are a team that when they control the puck, they can dominate a game. So you have to watch that St. Cloud state. You know, this is a team that has been up and down, up and down all season, not a real star studded roster, but a lot of college hockey experience in that group and a team that is very difficult to play against. And then Omaha, they're going to be way more than just happy to be there. They are scrappy. They've got some real good talent on their team. They've got some good goaltending. So I think that that is a team to, uh, you know, you can't take them lightly, but those are the games that are happening in the conference championship. And as we look at that, just want to, Take a look at the pairwise probability matrix from College Hockey News, a tremendous asset this time of year for figuring out really who has a chance. And St. Cloud State is one of those teams where basically they've got to win. Uh, they, they've got to win to get in. Um, there is a 9% a chance of an at-large qualifier. So a lot of things would have to go their way in order to not win the NCHC and still get into the national tournament. But it's not out of the question. They would just need a lot of help. So they're currently 16th in the pairwise. Cornell, we already mentioned, they got a win to get in. Only a 28% chance overall and a 0% chance of an at-large. It has to be through the conference championship setting. Um, they're getting good odds there. If you're, you know, they're not great odds, but they're still good odds um, to get in as the automatic qualifier. Colorado College sitting at 14th, 49% chance, only an at-large opportunity. They basically need favorites to win. They're sitting in a very precarious spot there at 14. So if they are, if any of these non-favorites win, because most of the favorites are teams that are already in as at-larges in the NCAA, they would be knocked out. So they have a less than 50% chance at this moment of getting into the NCAA tournament. We mentioned UMass as well, 91% chance with an 84% at-large opportunity. Western Michigan, currently done, no longer playing, 99% chance of getting in as an at-large. They're looking safe, but we have seen teams 
And I go back to Minnesota Duluth a few years ago. It was like point zero zero, <coughs> excuse me, zero one that they uh, that they ended up getting in and then won it. So you never really know at this time of year. But Boston College, Boston University, they are essentially locked into number one and number two overall in the pairwise. It, there is really nothing that can move either from that, according to College Hockey News' probability matrix, 100% Boston College is one overall, 100% Boston University is number two overall, regardless of what happens in the Hockey East tournament. And then things get a bit murkier after that. Denver is currently number three, North Dakota is four, Michigan State five, Maine six, seven is Quinnipiac, eight is Minnesota, nine is Wisconsin. Both teams, Minnesota and Wisconsin, done uh, in their conference tournament after losing last week. And then you've got Michigan, Omaha, and they are currently listed at 100% probability. Uh, Michigan's got a 60% chance as an at-large uh, and a 86% chance as an at-large for Omaha. So really good odds for those programs to get into the tournament. So with that, before I get into our next topic at hand, I did want to quickly, you know, Talk a bit about that bubble there, because I think Colorado College, that's a team that has had such a tremendous season. Uh, you have to give a ton of credit to Chris Mayotte and the job that he's done in Colorado Springs. Caden Umberico had a, had a, just an, an all-world year in net uh, for them. Noah Laba has been uh, just an incredible producer for that team. Things Good things are happening in Colorado Springs, and I lived in the Springs the last time CC was – you know, as, as relevant as they've ever been. They had a number of like, pro players. Richard Bachman was their goalie. Jack Hillen was one of their top players that, you know, the Jaden Schwartz was a player there uh, a couple years after that. So this is a program that, that really has been one of the, the real treasures of college hockey in a while since they've been this competitive, but it goes to show when you make a solid hire in the coaching ranks, it gives you an opportunity to, to be, I, I think CC is ahead of schedule of where they should be. Um, and maybe, you know, like you think about if, if they were able to hold on to Hunter McCown for an extra year, you know, if, if, if certain guys would have stayed a little bit longer, maybe they have a better chance, but they're right in the mix. So they will be watching the TV like the rest of us, hoping that, uh, well, I don't care who wins, but they'll be hoping uh, who, who, you know, those teams get in. But it, that's a team that's really interesting. And then Cornell, now controlling their own destiny. I love when a team plays with desperation. I think that when you see a team that knows that they have to do everything to get into the tournament, there's just no holding back. It makes for very entertaining hockey. They've got a tough test against Dartmouth. They play in the net. If they can advance out of that, go into the championship game, they put themselves in the driver's seat and that would, you know, potentially knock out another team uh, that, that gets, that gets CC um, out of the tournament. So, uh, and then St. Cloud State, very similar. There's a very minimal chance that they can get in without winning the NCHC, so they would prefer to control their own destiny. That desperation, those games are a lot of fun to watch. All right, before we move out of college hockey, I do want to talk about one last topic on the college hockey front, and that's the Hobie Baker race. And I think that this is going to be really fascinating uh, because – it is, it's felt wide open, but now that we're getting into conference awards season, it allows us to kind of narrow the field a little bit because it is very, very difficult, though not impossible. It's very, very difficult to win the Hobie Baker without even being your conference's player of the year. So as of right now, Will Smith is the leading scorer in college hockey with 58 points. However, Cutter Gauthier, his teammate, who has um, 52 points but 32 goals, is up for Hockey East Player of the Year. So Will Smith is not, but Cutter Goche is. That can often be one of those, you know, I think Will Smith will absolutely be in the Hobie top 10. I don't think he's going to, you know, have as, as good a chance of winning the award unless something crazy happens here in the next couple of days or a couple of weeks and, and he goes off and has like, you know, a 10-point weekend or something, which is totally possible with as far as Will Smith goes. And, you know, really unseats, you know, is able to kind of push some of those conference awards away. But it's it's Cutter Goche, um, Macklin Celebrini, and then Ryan Ufko, a defenseman from UMass, who is, are the three players, the three finalists for college hockey's or Hockey East Player of the Year award. So 
that helps it narrow it down. Over in the Big Ten, the player of the year there, Gavin Brindley. So Gavin Brindley is top six in scoring, has a real good chance of getting into the Hobie top ten. That's another guy where I don't necessarily know if he's going to have the juice to be the uh, a Hobie hat trick finalist, barring something there. Jackson Blake in the NCHC, currently second in scoring in the NCAA, 57 points for him. So that is another player where I say, okay, well, that is a guy that is absolutely leading a team, leading one of the best teams. I think Blake, who is a sophomore drafted by the Carolina Hurricanes, has a real chance to contend for the Hobie. I think he'll probably, as of this point, looks like a real good a good chance to get in uh, to the hat trick. But I really do think that this award is going to come down to Cutter Gauthier and Macklin Celebrini. Celebrini, as of right now, while he is not leading in raw points, he is leading in points per game. He has 55 points total in 33 games. That's a 1.67 points per game average. Gabe Perot of Boston College also has a 1.67 points per game average. He's missed the last several games. Um, he's now missed five games with uh, Boston College due to injury, so it probably takes him out of that group as well. Rucker McGrody currently sits fourth in that category. Massimo Rizzo, who's also been out injured, uh, is is fifth in that category at 1.57 points per game. And then Colin Graff, who's another player that I feel has a real good chance to win the Hobie, but also missed some time this year, 31 games played. So not a ton of missed time, but 31 games played at 1.55 points per game. So as we look at this and we handicap, keep an eye on those individual awards races. Some of them have been handed out like in the big 10, like in Atlantic hockey, like in the CCHA, but more of them are yet to be determined. And, you know, I, I think you, you look at some of the other, the NCHC, Zeev Bouyam, we've talked about him as a possible Hobie candidate. He's not among the top three finalists for player of the year in the NCHC. Jack Devine, his teammate is, and one of the top scorers in the country in terms of goals scored. So you never really know. So it's, it's, it's very interesting, but we are expecting the Hobie top 10 to come out this week as we record this. So it'll probably be out by the time you hear this podcast. So make sure you go over to flowhockey.tv to get my breakdown of the Hobie top 10 as I look at who I think have the best chances. But I really do think, based on the way this season has gone, it more than likely comes down to Cutter Goche or Macklin Celebrini for the Hobie Baker. But there's still enough hockey to be played where that can change. All right. Well, we got through that, and I want to tell you a little bit about what we saw in Flow Hockey the last week. This is a, a segment we do each week where I talk a little bit about what you can see on Flow Hockey and also – uh, this past weekend was something very near and dear to my heart. Uh, the ACHA national championships were under underway in St. Louis. They lasted 10 days. It's a tremendous event. There are five divisions of ACHA hockey. It is non-varsity or, you know, the, the dirty word is to call it club college hockey. Uh, but that's, you know, many of these teams are student run organizations and it is a fantastic level of hockey. And we had some dramatic, dramatic moments throughout that tournament. But before we get into that, I did want to give a, a quick congratulations to the ACHA national champions. Adrian College won both men's and women's division one the first time since 2010 when Lindenwood did it. Uh, that the men's and women's teams swept the Division I championship. Indiana won a dramatic overtime game over Miami to win the men's Division II national championship. Lawrence Tech had a very impressive performance in men's Division Three, And Sioux College, a Canadian school, <laughs> is, is the American Collegiate Hockey Association national champion in women's Division II, and that was also a very uh, intriguing game um, in that D2 final. We had every single game. If you want to go back and watch any of these, they are all available on demand on flowhockey.tv. But if there is one thing you should see from this event, it is one of the craziest hockey games I've ever watched. And, you know, it was fun to follow all these because I, I went to Iowa State. I worked for the team there for a couple of years. My, my college hockey career started there. Not on the ice, but in the broadcast booth and and in in the in the offices trying to uh, help promote the team, and it was a real great experience. Um, so I have such a soft place in my heart for for the ACHA because this is, I mean, passion is what drives these players. They're looking to play the most competitive hockey that they can, 
while they still can. And, and, and in the meanwhile, represent their school and do some great things. Well, Miami University, which does have a men's Division I hockey team at the NCAA level, also has an ACHA Division II team. And they played one of the craziest games I've ever seen. Keene State, this is in a, the pool play of their national championship. So, you know, important to get the victory. Miami is down 5-2. to two with under three minutes to play in regulation, five to two. They are trailing Keene State five to two. One of the players from Keene State gets an ejection, a spearing ejection and a five minute major penalty. And wouldn't you know it, over a two minute, a span I believe of 138, Miami scores not once, not twice, not thrice, not even four times. They score five times on the major power play, including an empty netter, and they win seven to five. And Miami ended up advancing to the national championship game, again came back, forced to come back against Indiana, and unfortunately lost in overtime of that game. But seeing a team down 5-2 come all the way back in under three minutes of play to – I mean, it was pandemonium in that building, and it was absolutely wild to watch. And, I mean, it just – watching ACHA hockey on flow was such a great experience. I'm really looking forward to next year's tournament. I'll be back in St. Louis for 2025. My hope is that my alma mater, Iowa State, is playing for a national championship. I'd love to see them do that again. Um, and so that is what we're going to – gonna hope for and 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 then maybe i'll even have to make the drive down but just want to give a quick shout out to the acha awesome events tremendous uh just tremendous um uh, interest in this tournament uh as we got to see just how many people love this level of hockey and it was great to watch so uh congrats to all the champions and good luck to everybody next year and we'll be very excited to have that once again on flow hockey all right, so now it's time to move into your listener questions, and we're going to talk a little bit about the NHL draft. We're going to talk a little bit about the trade deadline since I wasn't around last week to recap it, but I got a lot of good questions, a lot of thought-provoking questions, and so hopefully there's something in here that you've been thinking about and you wanted to have answered. And uh, as always, you can hit me up on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it these days, at Chris M. Peters, and I will answer your question. So our first one today comes from Alex, and we're going back to the NHL trade deadline. Question for the podcast. What's your opinion on the Penguins' return for Jake Gensel? Seems like maybe more quantity over quality. How do you see these prospects fitting in for the Pens? So quantity over quality, I think, is absolutely the right description for this. I think that it is one of those... You know, I think if you were a Penguins fan, you wanted an A prospect in this deal. You wanted something of of high value in this deal um, beyond a first round draft pick, beyond, you know, B prospects. What they got was essentially mostly B prospects. However, I will say Billy Koivinen, who was a part of this deal, is a high B prospect for me. He had a breakout season in Liga. He's going to be an NHL player. I think he's got the work ethic, the talent, the two-way capabilities. I really like what he does, and I think that he's going to be able to continue to do that. So so Billy Koivinen, two-way guy, good production, probably scoring depth, more likely in a middle six, third-line role. That's not exactly super exciting when you lose a top-line player like Jake Gensel, but it is something. Um also, you got Vasily Panamarov, who I think is a, a really good player. I had him ranked as a first-round draft prospect in his draft year. In hindsight, that was too high for him. He's been a, a solid, not amazing U, uh, AHL player um, the last couple of years. I like the player quite a bit still. I think he's got good work ethic. There's a little bit of power to him. He's got skill. He's got hands. He's got the ability. So that's another interesting prospect. Cruz Lucius. Probably a longer-term project, but he has really come on strong this year for Wisconsin. He's been one of their top players. You know, a mid-round pick that I think is a guy that's going to exceed his draft value or his draft position as a prospect, but I don't think he's necessarily a lock to be an NHL player. Um, but then also you have to consider the fact that the Penguins also got an everyday NHLer in Michael Bunting, a guy that plays an abrasive style that should fit well with that team. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, could they have gotten more? I think everybody would have liked to have them to get more. The question I have for the Penguins going forward is what's next? Because they're not rebuilding. As long as you have Sidney Crosby, you can't rebuild. So the question is, is what do you do? And I don't think you, if you're a, if you're a general manager, I said this on the athletic hockey show, another podcast I do, you know, I, I said, it, you can't be the general manager that traded Sidney Crosby. You can't do it. I, I mean, I know that everybody is, you know, Gretzky has gotten traded, but you know, Sidney Crosby is in the best 36 year old season that really anybody's had in the NHL and it's gone to waste. But at the same time, you know that there's more in that tank and he's probably going to be an exceptional player for a few more years. And as long as he's going, you want to try and go for it. Whether or not that's conducive to long-term success or sustainable success is really the question that Kyle Dubas is going to have to answer going forward. So it is a very long road ahead for this, uh, for this Penguins team. And there are no clear answers in this whole thing. All right, let's get into a little bit of draft talk. And I like this question from Charlie that came in a little bit late in the process. And boy, was I glad to see it. Charlie asks, if the Sharks get the number one pick, the Penguins slide out of the top 10 to 11 or 12. And Shane, or and Cole, I keep doing that to Cole Eiserman. Cole Eiserman is available there. Should the Sharks take the opportunity to reunite Celebrini and Eiserman? Or should they take a D like Parekh or Yakemchuk, Yakemchuk or Booyam? Really interesting question from Charlie and something to provoke a little bit of thought here. They are getting the Penguins uh, first first round pick. It is top 10 protected, uh, but if it slides out, that's in a really good position for the Sharks to still get good value. I think there's at least a chance that Cole Eiserman is still available on the board at 11 or 12. Um, I think that his stock has slipped a little bit, even though he's continued to score goals. I think that teams are just not convinced that there's enough of a well-rounded game there for him to be a top 10 pick um, and certainly not a top five pick at this point. But, you know, I, I think if you are the San Jose Sharks, you have to take the best player. And if that's Cole Eiserman on your board, you take him. Uh, but, you know, you look at the defense and it's really tantalizing the skill that that you can get from a Zane Parekh or a Zeev Booyam or a Carter Yakemchuk. Uh, you know, like I, I think that those are those are players that do help you, that are guys that could, you know, should be available or could be available in that range. I think, you know, Parekh, is, it, Parekh and Booyam have kind of shifted around in terms of which one teams like more. I think, you know, Booyam is um, a little bit more uh, naturally – skilled and and it's i mean that's even hard to say i mean they're so exceptionally skilled both of them um you know so it's 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 going to be an interesting spot i think if you're the if you're the sharks you need variety in your system you need um you know you need high value players and if you have your list and cole eiserman is is ahead of any of those defensemen you take cole eiserman you don't take it because you reunite him with macklin celebrini i mean those guys played together you know a few years ago I think it's unlikely that Celebrini is going to stick around for another year of college to, to, to play with Iserman again at BU. Not out of the question, but unlikely based on what we've seen from Celebrini this season. And, you know, I think that there's there's a real good chance that you can, you know, you just want to get the best pair. But if if any of those defensemen are ahead of him, I mean, they do fill a need. I think with Booyam and Perak in particular, you know, you think about the void that's been left by Brent Burns, by Eric Carlson over the years, you know, can, can you, can you supplement that? And yes, you got Kalen Addison, but you know, I don't think that's a guy that you want in your top four or top two, you certainly not in your top pairing. Whereas some of these guys have some top pairing upside. I don't know that any of them projects as a number one or a number two very comfortably, uh, but they are players that have a skill set that is very valuable in the modern NHL, which is that they move pucks, they move them exceptionally well, they have skill, they can get pucks out of their zone, and they can create offense from the back end. So very valuable players there. Should be an interesting one. Great question, Charlie. Thank you for it. All right, let's move on to our next question. This comes from Matapumo. And the question is, do you think draft prospects rise and fall based on where they're going for development? Examples. EJ Emery is going to North Dakota versus another D of a similar caliber going to the CHL or a different college. And it's a good question. I think teams consider it, but I don't think it has a, a significant impact on where a player goes. And it certainly doesn't impact, like I might think about that 
more than an NHL team does because I think, hey, you know, like EJ Emery's going to North Dakota. That's a, a, a an NHL defenseman factory. You know, Brad Berry's been very good with with NHL defensemen. You know, Jake Sanderson was there. That might give me a little bit more comfort with that player and what their plan is. But I don't think it really affects it too much. There have been instances where teams aren't comfortable with where a player is. And so they just sign the player and dictate where they're going. Or, you know, they they talk. Usually if it's a CHL team, there's not, they don't really like force them to trade them or anything, but they do things a little differently. So I would say that, you know, it's, it's definitely a different um, kind of thing that you consider, but most teams are going to be comfortable with the player because you're drafting the player, not the circumstance, Uh, but the circumstance obviously has a very big impact on what happens next. There is one area where I do think that it might give teams a little bit more pause, and that's with the Russian players. They might say, okay, we're not necessarily afraid about whether or not he's going to sign with us. We are afraid about him sitting on the bench for two years and not getting enough playing time and not developing properly because KHL teams have no incentive to develop players for the NHL. There's you know, there's no agreement. There's, there's the whole thing with contracts and everything else, and you know, there's a lot of contentiousness there. But so that's I, I'd say that that is a one area where you see a difference. So that's one where we'll have to you know kind of monitor it. But I really don't think most most teams don't seem to have that big of a, a care on that where a player is going to be unless it's such a bad situation they just sign the player and either put them in the you know put them in the chl if they're they're in a pro college program they don't particularly like um there was a time when kyle aposo signed the 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 new york islanders weren't happy with how he was being developed in minnesota so they signed him to an nhl contract i mean that that has happened in the past as well um so teams will find ways to exact their control whenever they can and our next question uh, will come via direct message. Um, and this came a couple a while ago, so I'm catching up on this question. And it's from Christian about the Anaheim Ducks. And he asked, curious as to why you believe the Ducks have success drafting D-men. They seem to have a method of drafting them the tall, lanky, athletic, with room to physically grow type. If you were in charge of the Ducks' first pick this year, minus taking Celebrini at number one overall, who would you target and why? As always, thank you. Well, thank you, Christian, for the question. And, you know, I don't think that the Ducks necessarily have a strict philosophy in how they draft defensemen. I mean, you think about the guys they've taken the last couple of years, um, and they're, they're, they're players of all different kinds of ability, but they typically have drafted defensemen that have a strong puck-moving capability. Um, they are not a team that is going to go heavily on the defensive defenseman. And if they do, they're not going to draft those guys particularly early. The guys that they draft early, you think about Jamie Drysdale, you know, high-end producer in, in junior. You think about Olin Zellweger, a high-end producer in junior. You think about Pavel Mentukov, high-end producer in junior. You know, so that's those are the types of players that they're getting. And then, you know, you even go back to last year, taking a Rodwin Dionisio, taking a swing on him in the fifth round. That's a highly skilled player with a lot of, you know, flash and dance. One guy that kind of breaks the trend two years ago, Noah Warren, more of a de- defense first physical shutdown guy. Um, you know, but when you have so many puck movers, you need guys like uh, uh, a Noah Warren. But I think that basically it just kind of ends up being cyclical. They have guys that they like, they have a type of player that they, they feel can fit with what they're doing and they go get those guys and they're not afraid to take them early. Like you look at an Ian Moore a couple of years ago, that that was an earlier than expected pick for Ian Moore in the third round. Um, you know, Jackson Lacombe was a, was a, a, a early second round pick Henry Thrun, another guy that moves pucks. He ended up being a trade ship for them down the road so i mean it's been really impressive and it even goes back to drafting cam fowler i mean every single one of those guys has a skill element to their game um and and it's worked out well for them so you got to give them credit as far as this draft goes for the anaheim ducks what do they do i think the most important thing that they do is continue to draft for uh the best player available if they're at the top of this draft where they have needs for me as far as i'm concerned i think that their needs are on the wing um, they've got really good center depth. They've got guys that, that can play center and wing. I think that getting a, a guy that can really be a higher end finisher would be great for them, which makes me intrigued by the possibility of an Ivan Demidov or a, uh, or a Cole Iserman. Um, you know, they just traded Jakob Perot, who was a guy that they hoped 
would be uh, a, a high end score. It didn't work out. Um, you know, they have guys that can play a high skill game like Leo Carlson and Trevor Zegers and Troy Terry. But I think if you can find some of those finishers, and that's why guys like Demidov make a lot of sense, especially when you know you've got a real good core of defensemen. Let's start beefing up that forward group even more. Um, so I would expect them to go forward. Uh, I think Caden Lindstrom is a good fit. I think Berkeley Catton could be a good fit. You know, they've got some guys with size. So, you know, if you want to get bigger, you think about, you know, they've, they've got strength. So continuing to bolster that really strong wing um, I mean, you look at the Ducks and boy, what a, what a system they have built right now. The guys that they have under 23 in their system um, at the end should be one of the envies of the league because they've got it in so many positions. Then you see Lucas Dostal playing as well as he has this year. It's been really good for them. So a lot of credit to the Ducks for the job that they've done. All right. So our next question comes from Shokunin. And the question is, what is your NHL projection for Danila Yurov? First round pick of the Minnesota Wild. And Danila Yurov is an exceptional talent. He just is coming off a, a tremendous year in the KHL. 49 points in 62 games. 21 goals for Metalurg in the KHL. at a, And he just turned 20 in December. So Yurov is, is, a, is an outstanding player. He's got good size, good strength. He's got uh, some power to his game. He's got skill. I think to me, you know, the optimistic projection of him is that he's a top six forward, a scoring forward that can play in your top six. And and I think that that's a reasonably optimistic uh, thing. It's not it's not overly optimistic. I think it's a reasonable projection for him um, when he was drafted 24th overall. I mean, this is a guy that I thought had the Russian factor not been as pronounced for him. Um he could have gone earlier. I think this was the very early stages of we're just trying to figure things out about where things are going. Um, and so he goes 24th overall. Great spot for the Wild to pick him up. Um, you know, they obviously have had success with the Russian player in, in Kirill Kaprizov, which builds them some cachet. Um, they just got Vladislav Firstov back from the KHL. Um, as of right now, we're waiting to see will Yurov re-sign in the in the KHL. It, it, it sounds like he will for at least another year. Um, that should be okay. I don't know that necessarily he's going to be able to jump right into the NHL, but that's a guy that I think has top six potential uh, and has very reasonably raised the level of expectation for what he can be with how well he played in the KHL this season. All right, we got one more, and then we're going to get out of here. We'll have a few that I, I, I'll leave as leftovers for next week, uh, but we got plenty of time. This one comes from Riz, and Riz asks, what's the ETA on Oliver Moore and Sam Rinzel on becoming NHLers? Well, two Chicago Blackhawks prospects. We've talked about them quite a bit. Um, you know, I think I've said before, I think that they're both back in school, at least for next season. Um, we'll see where things go after that. Sam Rinzel was a, a second uh, all-rookie team. Both of them were all-rookie team selections for the Big Ten. You know, neither of them, both of them played extremely well this year, but neither of them have dominated. And I think, you know, you want to master the level that you're at before you move on. And I don't think either of them have, have really come close to that, even though they played really, really well as freshmen. So I would say, you know, the, the earliest is after next season. And I think that's potentially overly optimistic for both of them. But Renzel has really, really, really uh, picked it up in a way that, uh, you know, I think that, there's you're starting to see the flashes of NHL capabilities more and more and more with him. And I think with Oliver Moore, you watch him skate, you watch him handle the puck, you watch him do various things. You watch him play a strong two-way game. He can do anything. He's a Swiss army knife. Uh, that's a value, valuable player. I think that we'll see him in a couple of years. So Blackhawks are going to have some interesting decisions in terms of contracts when they offer how, you know, what kind of timeline you want to kind of stagger all these young players that are coming in. You don't want them all to come in at once. And then you're, you know, on the same contract schedule, but it's a good problem to have when you have a lot of good young players and the Blackhawks certainly do have that. And they will have another one after this upcoming draft or, or a few more. All right. So that's going to do it for our Q and A's. I want to thank you guys for asking those questions. A huge thanks to Josh for producing today, working through some of our, our technical difficulties as we got through them. And uh, it's always uh, never, never a dull moment in the 
great world of video podcasting here at Flow Hockey. But what a fun time of year this is. Hope you guys really enjoyed the show. There's plenty more to come. We'll recap the championship games next weekend. We'll preview the NCAA tournament with a, a special guest. And we will continue working towards the 2024 NHL draft as well. Make sure you are subscribed to flowhockey.tv for all the great hockey action coming your way. Subscribe to this podcast, leave a kind rating and review, and uh, otherwise enjoy your week. Thanks a lot for joining us on this week's edition of Talking Hockey Sense. My name is Chris Peters. We'll catch you next time.